A very good evening and welcome to Kivumbi 2023. It's about five minutes past the top of the hour and that is the right time to begin the English session of Kivumbi 2022. And tonight, it's all about the integrity question. This is our newsroom where everything that you see out there on television or on the newspaper or in the newspaper or online is cooked. And this is exactly where our operations are based. And definitely the newspaper you're picking tomorrow is being cooked right here at the Nav Center of uh, Standard Group along Mombasa Road. Well, good evening and welcome to the show. Let's begin it now. The Constitution 2010 that sought to establish cement or better still, cast in stone, a new threshold and value system in the country with Chapter 6 on leadership and integrity seen as a nerve center that will help reverse the culture of impunity in the country. Local potential and deserving leaders. Yet, 11 years on, this remains one of the most mutilated chapters of the Constitution. Implementation and weak enforcement challenges as well as lack of comprehensive mechanism for determining compliance continue to render this all-important chapter, to put it plainly, useless now leaders failing by or falling by the wayside somehow find themselves back into circulation now the courts are the main enablers in this they usually see the leaders back into circulation as i said the constitution creating the framework seen as in conflict with some chapters of the constitution including the chapter on rights well tonight we open the lead on this one of the most abused chapters of the Constitution, and incidentally the shortest. I will be speaking to Samuel Kimeo, the former executive director at Transparency International. I will also be breaking down the provisions of the Constitution to the last and most relevant sections for our discussion tonight. But first, Akisa. Well, Ken, and of course, uh, this coming at a time when leaders in various positions are seen to be taking advantage of loopholes within the law, the grey areas aided by the Constitution itself to, say, to safeguard themselves at the expense of the electorate. And as we head into crucial polls in 2022, the elephant in the room is just how can the country make Chapter 6 work for her and what can the institutions do? Are there changes or amendments needed? Is it a matter of morality and self-conscience? Or the law is simply the law? What will, the, what will be the place of the critical Chapter 6 be in the next general election? Will it in any way help raise the threshold of leadership qualities? And will it count? Come 2022 at 10 p.m., constitutional lawyer Tom Ogenda will be joining us. So is Eric Ngumbi, who is in charge of ethics and development of the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. David Oching, a practicing politician, will also be joining us here on the round table as we delve deeper into issues around leadership and integrity. I'll also be updating you on the day's top stories at 9 p.m. here on Kivumbe 2022. But first, Ken has the data. Ken, let's set the stage. Right, let's set the stage. And of course, Samuel Kimeo is already in the house. He's already seated. I'm speaking to him shortly. Sophia Wanuna is away for tonight. But she will be back next week. And will leaders facing integrity uh, issues such as corruption be clear to vie for various elected positions? This is the question that lingers among Kenyans who appear to be at loss over the contents of Chapter 6 of the Constitution. Now, key agencies, including ESCC, IEBC, and ODPP, Office of the Director of Public Prosecution, maintain that gaps in law have made it difficult for them to bar politicians with integrity questions from vying for various positions. As Jeff Kirui now reports, a proposed bill before the Justice and Legal Affairs Committee in Parliament is seeking to allow the agencies to lock out anyone facing charges in court from vying for an elective position. With less than 10 months to the 2022 general election, politicians eyeing various seats have been on an overdrive to woo voters to their sides. The campaigns have completely overshadowed the constitutional requirement of integrity of state officers and those eyeing elective seats. Ugunza, member of parliament, Opio Wandai, is seeking to amend the Elections Act as well as the Leadership and Integrity Act to empower IEBC and ESCC to lock out people with court cases from vying in the coming elections. The amendments are basically uh, aimed at, first and foremost, stopping any person who has been charged with corruption related offenses from being cleared to run for elective office. 
According to the IEBC and the ESCC, the hands are currently tied. They can't stop anyone with a case in court because Article 99, Subsection 2 of the Constitution outlines the manner in which someone can be barred from contesting. That law states that a person can only be barred once convicted of an offense. The same law adds that disqualification can only be done after all avenues for appeals have been exhausted. This is a loophole that gives people with integrity issues to escape disqualification. When you get an aspirant with fake Form 4 certificate, if you get an aspirant with a fake military rank, if you get an aspirant, you know very well he was working in this company and he was sacked because he stole. They will go and get a lawyer and the lawyer will say, when was he charged? He has not been convicted. So we have a lot of uh, we have, those, those are the challenges we have as a commission, and uh, as for IBC, it is the same. Currently, more than five governors are facing charges in court, among them Okoso Bad of Migori, Busia's Suspita Jamong, Samburu's Moses Lenol Kulal, Tarakan Nithi's Mudo Minjuki, and Ali Kurani of Garissa. <laughs> Former Nairobi Governor Mike Mbovi Sonko and former Kiambu Governor Ferdinand White were impeached on grounds of abuse of office and misappropriation of county funds. At the August House, at least 15 MPs, most of whom are defending their seats in the 2022 polls, have graft cases ongoing in court. If you stop them, they'll go to court. When they go to court, their lawyers will invoke those two articles, say no mechanisms have been exploited to show that these people are guilty. So they get a free way. It, it is an area that has a lacuna, and if not addressed, then we will still have this problem. It will be a recurring problem. If we just took those bold steps as a country, and the judiciary stands with us, then we shall have started the journey of, of, of slaying this dragon of, of corruption. Yes, but it, there must be political will from the very top. We should set timelines when cases should be dispensed off. You know, justice delayed is justice denied. Death. Kirui KT News. Right, the stage is set now for our discussion tonight and all our content is right here on the screen right now. Let's begin by Article 38 of the Constitution, a very important article because this is what enables you as citizen of Kenya to participate in the election. So, Article 38 make, allows the citizens to make political choices, form or participate in forming a political party, participate in the activities or recruit party members. Article 38 still uh, allows you to campaign for a political party or a cause that you believe in, right to free, fair and regular election, not the words that the Constitution is using, right to free, fair and regular election for elective public body or office. That's why every five years we have an election and, of course, we have the by-election. Other citizens' rights, it also gives you the right to vote, register as a voter or vie for a public office in the country. You look at how this is conflicting with the Leadership and Integrity Act, late Article 38. So, after looking at Article 38, it's just prudent to uh, define who are the public officers and what are their obligations under the Constitution. That's why we go to Article 260 of the Constitution that defines state officer as a person holding a state office. Therefore, a state officer in the country is a public officer, but not all public officers, not that, are state officers. Every person who holds a public office, office however, in Kenya, is a public officer. That's Article 260 of the Constitution. So once you know who can run and who public officers are defined as, which include the president, the members of parliament, the MCAs, the judiciary, uh, members of uh, commissions, the constitutional commissions, uh, the IG of the police, and all that, let's go to the qualifications and disqualifications for elections according to Article 90 and Article 99 of the Constitution. So we begin with the Member of Parliament. This is very simple. You must be a registered voter. You must satisfy any education, moral, and ethical requirement of the Constitution. Is also nominated by a political party, or you can be an independent candidate. And in the last years, we've seen a lot of independent candidates coming up, so that's a requirement. What of the President and the Deputy President? Well, it's a little bit vast. I'll go through a few. You must be a Kenyan citizen by birth. Very important, you must have been a Kenyan citizen by birth in order for you to run for president. 
you must be qualified to stand for election as a member of parliament. What we have stated previously must not owe allegiance to a foreign state. Very important. You must also be a registered voter and you're a holder of a degree from a university recognized in the country and you're nominated by a political party or you are an independent candidate. The last election, there were 44 presidential candidates running as independent. Um, um, actually, there were three running for independent, 44 members of parliament running as, in, uh, as independent candidates. So the legal requirement for the deputy president is the same as that of the president and uh, must not be a public officer at the time you're running, must meet the moral and ethical requirements, must not hold dual citizenship. This is why the IBC has released those regulations that six months before the election, if you're a public officer, you must resign. So the legal requirements for the DP and the president, you must not have been uh, a dis undischarged bankrupt, must not be a person of unsound mind, you must really be of sound mind, must not be subject to a sentence or imprisonment of at least six months before the general election or after. That's very important. And finally, let's talk about the sticking issues that we have borrowed from Article 38, Article 260, 90, and of course, Article 99. This is very important. They're sticking issues because this is a subject of our discussion tonight. You must not be subject to a sentence of imprisonment at least six months from the date of registration of a candidate or date of election. You will find out that this is very abused and must not have been found to have abused or misused state or public office or contravene chapter six of the constitution. Now this second provision is one of the most contentious because we're discussing it tonight, we'll go back to it, must not have been uh, dismissed or removed from public office for contravening the provisions of the following articles of the Constitution. Article 75, conduct of state officer. Article 76, finance and property of state officers. Article 77, restrictions on activities of state officer. And Article 78, citizenship and leadership. If you have contravened any of these articles tonight, you cannot run for an elective position. But are people listening? Are the candidates listening? Are the institutions, EACC, IABC, ODPP, all those institutions that are supposed to be clearing the candidates before they run for election, are they listening? Are they paying attention to this? Well, we'll find out shortly because almost all elections, we have people who have been even indicted by the courts, but they still find their way to the ballot. That's where we begin our interesting conversation tonight because now on the white table, I'm joined by Samuel Kimeo. He's the former executive director at Transparency International. Thank you for coming, Sam. Thank you and very good much. Good to see you. Since 2010, you've maintained a low profile, but good to see you tonight. Thank very you. important. This subject is key to your heart. You, you were in the commission, was it uh, trans, uh, for nine years or eight years? Grounded to 10 years. 10 years as yeah. the executive director. <laughs> yes. You left in 2019, but you still served until the end of 2020, I think. I served in 2020. In 2020, yes. January 2020. January 2020. So yes. this is very important to you. Yes. Every election, hmm. um, chapter six of the constitution hmm. is seen to be a chapter that could bar candidates. But will we ever get it right with chapter six of the constitution from your assessment? Can we ever as a country get it right? Yes, we can. And I believe we will get there. There are a number of paths that, get, that can get us there. Uh, some of them are pretty difficult. The most obvious one would be an amendment of the Constitution in the article that you've just mentioned, Article 99.2, yes. which if you read the entire Constitution, you realize that must have been an afterthought. Okay. And it was inserted there, in my view, mischievously to take e away e from what had e been. Exactly. Yeah. I, I believe it was very mischievous by the politicians. Indeed. Yes. So, so that, w that would be one of the ways, which is a fairly difficult one, because then uh, I do not think the political uh, perspective about these issues has changed, mm -hmm. has changed much. Okay. The other path is really just to allow the judiciary to continue interpreting the law. Uh, and I do believe that our judges can see that contradiction and can actually breathe um, uh, life into, into that chapter six. And okay. a lot has happened in the courts actually since 2010. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you look at where we are today, with the cases that have, uh, have, have confronted the likes of Governor Sonko, the likes of Governor Waititu, Governor Lelon Kulal, you realize that we, we've made some progress okay. in enforcement. The fact that they were chapter. indicted. They were indicted. Yes. They were uh, ordered to, uh, to not to v go into their offices, um, which is in a way 
uh, an affirmation that they are actually not in office, so they can't quite discharge their responsibilities. So you achieve more the same, the same objective without having to say, uh, to rely on that constitutional provision, mm -hmm. which in a way uh, uh, would, would, would make sure that they remain in office until they, they have exhausted all levels of appeals. We talked about the conflict in the constitution and the provisions that allows these candidates or these aspirants or whoever they are to continue running for office. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you mentioned that the court should be allowed to continue interpreting the law and, and the police implementing whatever the outcome of the court is. But the question is the same same court is used to aid these people back into office because they go before your case is exhausted. Mm -hmm. You're allowed the instances that the court has taken uh, mm -hmm. them back to the office because especially impeachment because probably those a uh, process issue? Yeah, I, I think uh, we, we must appreciate the way the courts work. Um, uh, usually courts work on, uh, on, or based on precedent, but you can actually vacate for those, pro those precedents. And once uh, a principle has been established at the, at the high court, for example, it might take 10 years for you to be able to overcome that principle and change it completely. So we must be alive to that fact. And I do think that um, as more judges are courageous and venture into interpreting the Constitution in a purposeful manner that uh, pretty much uh, uh, bears recognition to the fact that these, some of these provisions were an afterthought. And reading the entire Constitution, mm -hmm. you can see clearly what the intention of the, the, the drafters of that Constitution was, insofar as integrity was concerned. You say there are afterthoughts. I think it was mischievous, because the politician, uh, politicians, I'll, I'll take you, for example, back to uh, impeachment of a member of parliament. It's an absolute impossibility. It was mischievous. They have to guard themselves because they know even during the constitution-making process, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure there were people who were tight in one way or another with all this, this quagmire about leadership and integrity. So it was mischievous. It was cleverly done to cushion them because the constitution is a political document. Absolutely. I think I agree with you. It was mischievous. And there are a number of those provisions that you can see were mischievous in the Constitution. And subsequently, in, in, uh, in enacting the Constitution, uh, the various laws that we put in place, you can see the hurdles that uh, the political class continues to place on the, uh, the achievement of our constitutional uh, order. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, is, there are things that were quite clear in the constitution in 2010, and every Kenyan knew what they meant, but somehow we have managed to convolute them to a level where it, is, it will take courage in terms of leadership, and leadership here is not just political, but also leadership from, from a judicial perspective, and leadership from our institutions to be able to, uh, you know, uh, to recover the territory okay. that we have lost to okay. our politicians. Okay. Yeah. Which, for, for me, having said that it was mischievous and intentional, it looks as if we have not lost it. It's, it's, it's somewhere, yet it cannot be applied. I'd like to give you specific examples, because the buck must stop somewhere. Right. So we're looking at institutions, my voice is a a little bit hoarse, but we're looking at institutions that should aid in the implementation of Chapter 6 of the Constitution. I'll give you an example, and I want you to look at it and tell me what you think. In 2016, March 2016, the Supreme Court upheld the decision of the High Court in Bungoma and Appeals Court in Kisumu that found Moses Wetangula uh, guilty of water bribery. But the IABC cleared him to vie in 2017 election, saying they had no evidence suggesting the senator's guilt as he was not convicted of the offense. The Bungoma senator was accused of competing, uh, committing the offense back in March 2013. This is three years later. We are heading into another election. Moses Wetangula needs to be cleared in 2016 for the 2017 election. Yet the institution of the IBC, in its wisdom, Mm -hmm. says we don't have evidence, and he was cleared in his uh, senator. That's one of the examples. The other, ODPP, the blame game, usually passed to the ODPP. Um, uh, we, we are going to talk to uh, the um, integrity body later, but also them, it's always back passing. So analyze that for us and talk to us about the responsibilities in the institution or of the institutions of ensuring that this chapter of the constitution is upheld. Yes, uh, allow me to just lay a bit of background because I do think that um, that uh, those two cases uh, you've you've mentioned um, really go to the core of what the problem is. I think we played into the hands of our politicians who wanted to lower the standard of integrity so low that they equated it to 
uh, to guilt and innocence. So that when you read that provision, you, you said that uh, the IBC said there was no, they, they didn't have evidence Them as the IBC. of guilt yes. or innocence. Mm -hmm. But why do you need to, de to determine guilt or innocence of a person? It can never be for purposes of leadership. You determine guilt or innocence for purposes of punishment. And to use that same standard for purposes of leadership, I think for me is completely mischievous and it is wrong. And I think our politicians have driven us into that kind of thinking mm -hmm. where, the, where, where matters of, of morality, ethics and integrity have been lower to a level that uh, for you to be found culpable, you need to have uh, been found guilty. And just to remind you that um, when you are talking about uh, guilt or innocence, it's in the realm of criminal law. And in criminal law, you cannot be convicted of any offense unless that offense has been proven beyond reasonable doubt. Meaning that if I entertain even the slightest iota of, uh, of doubt, as a judicial officer, I am supposed to let you off the hook. Yes. And now this is the same standard you want to apply for, for leadership. Criminal it's law. in the complete opposite, opposite yeah, of it, what it, the standard it's, is. It's a, it was a huge debate uh, uh, at the Supreme Court, I remember that. In, indeed. Yes. And then now coming to your specific question, I think that um, in that case, the IBC simply failed or refused to do its mandate. It's mm -hmm. not the only occasion where I think the IBC and other, uh, our other institutions I, I have, have several of them, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. So I do think that in a situation such as that, I think Kenyans must rise up and defend the constitution. Through I, the civil I ex society? I expect not necessarily mm -hmm. every Kenyan has a right under the constitution to defend the constitution. In fact, that constitution envisages an engaged citizenry, yeah. not a passive one. Mm -hmm. So I would have expected that someone would have taken the IEBC to court and held them accountable for the decision that they made in that particular case. Mm -hmm. And not just that, but many others where they have given leeway to people who would otherwise not be qualified to be on the ballot. And I think if we do that um, a couple of times, it will be very difficult for the IBC itself to find this excuse okay. and use it to benefit people who shouldn't be on the ballot. Election is a political process. At the back of what you're saying, elections are political processes. And they're, they're, even the codes are said to be at that time at the far end of an electoral process to play sort of a political body because they have to determine a political question at the end of the day that sometimes has no value in law. So they have to determine. So how is that even practical? Well, I, I, I think that politics and, and, and law are not strange bedfellows. But the role of our Constitutional Commission, the IEBC and others, uh, is not a political role. It is actually a legal, technical role. So there is so much that they have to do to ensure that the election is, is free and fair and that it, it is held in a very viable, and in a very viable manner and an, in a credible manner. So that cannot be a political question because politics is so imprecise that to use politics to, uh, you know, to manage an election, in my view, is to be completely lost and to misunderstand uh, the, the role of that IABC. Mm -hmm. There's another question I want to, uh, another clarification I want to make. I do think that we need our institutions, and, and Kenyans must, must help our institution appreciate this. Every institution must appreciate what its mandate is. And insofar as Chapter 6 is concerned, I, I, I see two things that are, that are critical. One is that the decision about who gets onto the ballot in an election is the decision of the IEBC. But if you look at chapter six, the, 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 the authority that has the legal constitutional competence to determine whether someone has complied with chapter six is the Ethics and Uncorruption Commission. So if the Ethics and Uncorruption Commission determines that someone is not qualified under Chapter 6, I do not think that the IABC can come and change that. Okay. In the same way that if KRA were to give uh, you, um, you know, a, a tax compliance certificate, I do not see the IABC question, questioning that. Challenging it. Yes. yes. Or the DCI mm -hmm. gives uh, a certificate of good conduct or otherwise, or w whatever uh, they call it. I think it is... It is uh, it, it, it is imp improper in law for the IBC 
to either disregard that, that information or purport to issue uh, alternative uh, decisions based on, on you know, the kind of thing that you are, you are mentioning, where you have a court process. And it applies also to the certificates. People yes. who, who have cases uh, or were under investigation in the last elections for using forged academic certificates, where institutions had come forward to disown those certificates, but still the IBC gave people a leeway mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in what I consider to be a complete contravention of the law. If our young people who are seeking employment in government today, if you turn up with uh, a fake certificate, a, a, a certificate that is questionable, the question of whether you have exhausted your remedies does not arise at all. Okay. You will not be allowed to proceed with that interview. Impossible. And as a matter of fact, charges will be opened against mm -hmm. you. But we have double standards. When it so, comes to politics. Yes. Yeah. Po the politician in this country operates in a space that, is, uh, that, 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 that the law is, is a wish. And we must make sure that the law applies to everybody. I'll take you back to um, the institutions and how they work. Is this a case of the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing or it's purposed, it's intentional right at the beginning? Well, I think in an institutional setup where, and I think it's important for purposes of checks and balances, to have several institutions dealing, dealing with several issues and mm -hmm. competencies. Um, the problem with that is that if you have three, four institutions that have to play a role for an outcome to to, 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 uh, for an, an outcome to be realized. Mm -hmm. If there is a failure in any one of those institutions, then the, the entire system fails. Yes, yes. So, and, and, and I give you an example, uh, because I think it's been in the public domain, that in the last election, the ESCC said that it had sent out names of people who were under investigation or who had cases uh, pending. Uh, against them, corruption cases pending against them. And to the best of my, lo my knowledge, the IEBC basically disregarded that information. Um, you see, the IEBC might, the, the ESCC might do its part, but if the, EAB, the IEBC doesn't do its part, then it's a failure. In the same vein that you can apply the, the, the uncorruption chain where you have investigations, you have prosecutions, and you have adjudication. If any of these fail, then the entire system has collapsed. Okay. So if, if, if just to illustrate it further, if um, someone is being investigated for a corruption case, if the investigation is botched, there will be no prosecution. No, there will be no pros a successful prosecution, prosecution and yes. there will be no finding of guilt, mm -hmm. uh, even if they were culpable. Same thing with prosecution and same thing with adjudication. So where you have institutions that have different but complementary uh, uh, mandates, then it is important that the chain works seamlessly. Okay. It is very easy to, uh, to shortchange, to sabotage such a system simply by attacking one of the institutions. Sam, that's one of the gray areas that exist because mm -hmm. of the working relationship between or relations between these um, agencies charged with different roles in this country. That's a gray area because there's nothing in law that mandates them to work with the other one. Actually, I think it's common sense. So to the extent that they do not work, uh, in my view, is, is either based out of uh, personal egos of people or simply people not wanting to discharge their mandate okay. because of other other ulterior reasons, yes. yeah. Okay. But if, if you, your work is to investigate uh, or to, to, to prosecute or to adjudicate, I, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would wonder, uh, I'll be at a loss to imagine why you wouldn't want uh, to be successful in your work. And okay. you cannot be successful if mm. all these others are you, not you successful. You have been in this country long enough to understand how the institutions work. It's, it's something that uh, I, I think your predecessor, you really try to deal with, but it's not working. The question I'm coming back to ask now, when we, uh, after this short break, is, is there lack of clarity in this chapter of the Constitution? Is it about rules of interpretation or who's interpreting what for who? And is that where the real problem lies? So when I come back, I'm going to be asking that question to Sam. He stays with me. We still have a lot to talk about, especially the fact that he dealt with this every single day. Ten years is a long time to uh, talk about a single issue without understanding. Someone uh, 
joins us um, in a few when we come back. But first, let's take this short break on Kivumbi 2022. We're back in a moment. Um, 